So for those who've already had botany, uh, this will hopefully be a review. I know not everybody's had botany, so we'll get into some of uh, our technical terminology here that we're going to use to describe different aspects of what a tree looks like, basically. And so with morphology, I'm going to go ahead and split it for us. And so you kind of have a rough life cycle of a tree here, where you have a seed, it germinates into a seedling. Then you go through vegetative growth, and that seedling gets larger and tree sized. And then at some point for an angiosperm, it'll flower for a gymnosperm, it'll cone. At that point, it's a reproductively mature tree, and it can start producing seed, and the whole cycle starts over again. And so what I want to do this class is basically talk about the vegetative portions of a tree and vegetative growth. So what are the vegetative portions, leaves, bark, twigs, all that, and then how do trees grow larger? that connects in with some of what we need to understand from a morphological standpoint in terms of actually identifying trees. And so let's start thinking about how trees grow a little bit. So you got a couple photos here with signs on trees, a posted sign, a wildlife sign. You can see the barbed wire fence on this tree here. So with uh, folks putting all sorts of stuff out on trees, especially on property boundaries, how often do you have to go out and take the sign off and put it down lower on the tree as it's going up? No, why are you shaking your head no, Logan? It never, it never moves upwards. Right, it's not going to move upwards. Why? Yeah, trees grow from the top up. Now grass, you have to keep mowing your grass because your grass grows from the bottom up. It's got a, a basal meristem. Um, so with trees, that's kind of fortunate. Otherwise, fencing and signage, that'd be a big hassle, right, if they had a basal meristem. So they grow from the top. And then they have two types of growth. So they grow in length from the top. That's primary growth. And then here's an example of what type of growth? Secondary growth. They're woody, so they expand in diameter after they've grown in length. And so you may have to replace a sign if the tree, you know, goes around it and eats it. Uh, you can see barbed wire right through the middle of big old trees. So they can grow around them. So we have primary growth and we have secondary growth in our woody species. And again, many of our non-woody species aren't going to have secondary growth. So everything we're talking about this semester, for the most part, is going to have There are three different types of primary growth that we want to learn about, and these will have some morphological differences that we'll actually be able to observe uh, in the field on some of our species. So on the left here, I have fixed growth, where if we look at fixed growth, another name for it is determinate growth, okay? And basically what happens is cells are formed when the bud sets, then the bud overwinters, and then when it breaks bud in the spring, it's all those cells that formed at the end of the last growing season, basically, okay, in the previous growing season. So last year's conditions determined how well that bud set up, and so they, they determine the potential for growth in a given year. But these twigs tend to be straight, and they tend to have true terminal bud, okay? And that sounds kind of confusing. What's a true terminal bud versus not a true terminal bud? But we'll get to that free growth, which is the opposite strategy. And free growth is also called indeterminate growth. So basically, twigs just keep growing throughout the growing season. They keep forming new cells as they're elongating. And growth continues until basically camp. You get an early freeze, or your day length becomes too short, or some other environmental condition stops them from continuing to grow that year. So it's this year's conditions that are determining the growth potential in that given year. These twigs aren't always, but they tend to be zigzag and they have pseudo terminal buds. Um, so let me see in here if I can draw this up on here for us. Okay, and so what this is gonna look like um, with a free growth species, the twig grows, it stops, then it grows and it stops and it grows and it stops. And at each point where it stops, it's putting on a little lateral bud. So there's the lateral bud there. There's the lateral bud there. Here's the lateral bud here. And then it continues growing. And at some point, this portion of it gets killed. Okay, an early freeze may kill it, for example. Well, then when this portion gets killed, it'll eventually die back. You can see where I just erased it. And then what has happened basically is this what was a lateral bud there now has become the terminal bud. That's why it's a pseudo terminal bud. 
It was never intended to be a terminal bud, but because it's the last bud on there, when it finally quit growing, it becomes a terminal bud. So look for the zigzag twigs, but also look for the fact that the terminal buds and the lateral buds look the same on a species that has free growth. You have one more form of growth that's intermediate uh, between these two strategies, and that's called recurrently flushing. And it's basically just a hybrid of the two. And so when we look at examples of each of these species, fixed growth trees like this red maple we'll learn in lab this week, nice straight twig, the terminal buds look a little different from the lateral buds. That's an example along with walnuts, yellow poplars, and we'll see yellow poplar in lab this week as well. Um, we're gonna learn river birch this week in lab, we're gonna learn elms next week, black locust, and you can see the twig is zigzag. And this bud here, the terminal bud, looks just like the lateral bud there. What a recurrently flushing species is, uh, our four southern pines are examples. And what I mean by recurrently flushing, what will happen with pine. So we had a pretty wet summer all in all until August when things really dried up. So this year our pines would have grown for a while in May. They would have set a bud. It was just a resting bud. It wasn't the bud that's going to overwinter. And then we kept getting rain. That bud broke another flush set a bud, that bud broke, another flush, set a bud. So if we have a really dry, bad summer, your pines may only flush twice here in the south. If we have a summer like we did this summer where it was wetter throughout, we may have like five flushes on the pines. So recurrently flushing means just that. It flushes periodically throughout one growing season. When you look at how these twigs work, here's that red maple twig again, where you can see the terminal bud. And then if you dissect this within the terminal bud, you have the apical meris down here, which is just a mound of dividing cells. And then you have some lateral buds here, which are also meristematic tissue. You can see some rudimentary leaves and some larger leaves there. But basically what happens is you have this region of actively dividing cells. And then below that region is where those cells that have been formed elongate, which is really what fuels our growth in the length of a twig. So this is where primary growth comes from. The cells dividing in the meristem and then elongating as they expand and fill with water. Basically. So when we look at a twig, we have a bunch of different terms that we use when we discuss twigs. Uh, right now, y'all are probably going to focus more on leaves out in the field, but twigs are going to be really good to know because once all our leaves fall off for the most part here uh, by the winter, you really focus pretty heavily on twig features. Where there are buds on a twig is called the node. Where there are not buds on the twig is between the nodes, so we call that the internode. But as we start looking through more and more of these features, we're going to start with what a twig is. We're only talking about last year's growth. So the twig is just last year's growth. If you go further back than that, you're looking at a branch. And then with twigs, if you want to identify a twig, the best thing you can do is find a branch that's way out in the sun on a tree. The more sun that branch is getting, the more photosynthate, the more sugar those leaves can produce, and the more features you'll see on that twig. So if a red maple twig is supposed to be red, or a macronut hickory twig is supposed to be real fuzzy, you'll find the reddest and the fuzziest twigs out in the sun where they get the most energy to put those features on. When a branch is broken out of a tree and fallen down and been on the ground for a year or two, whatever color it used to be, it, it almost always goes gray. Um, you start getting buds breaking off, you lose a lot of the features. So it's not as easy to identify a twig if it's been dead for a few years or if it's grown in heavy shade. When we start looking at different buds, you can have a terminal bud, okay, versus lateral buds that are on the side. Another way to describe terminal buds is apical buds. Those are synonymous. Lateral buds can also be called axillary buds. Those are synonymous. Sometimes we'll have collateral or superposed buds. So here's a good example of collateral flower buds that we're seeing here on this northern spice bush. We'll learn this week five, but you can see they're actually on little stalks and they're nice and round. So they're collateral because they're beside the vegetative bud. This is going to look very much like some of the red maple twigs that we'll see. And what you actually have is a lateral bud on the side of the twig, and it's surrounded by collateral flower buds on it. So co means beside. On some species like black gum, we'll see superimposed or sometimes it's referred to as superposed buds where one bud is above another bud. So this bud may break open and form a new twig and then this other bud may break open and form a leaf. 
where it may form a flower. That's why they have one above the other. Sometimes you can tell what a bud is going to produce just by looking at it. So here are two examples of buds on flowering dogwood. And these flower buds on flowering dogwood look like a little Hershey kiss shape. The vegetative buds that are going to produce twigs and leaves look like dull little cat claws. So in some cases, you can look at them and tell what they're actually going to produce on some species. Sometimes we have mixed buds. So on many of our pines, we'll have a bud that has the strobili in there that are going to form the cones as well as a vegetative bud, all wrapped together uh, in scales. So it actually will produce buds. And again, some buds may just produce a leaf, they may not produce a twig. Buds we think of as being on the above ground portion of a tree. So if we find those buds on the roots where we don't think they belong, we call them adventitious buds, but you do find that on some species. A dormant bud is what you would see around here in January, February, uh, December even, where the bud has set for winter and it's not going to open. That's a really good time to collect twigs. Um, so for bonus opportunity for this semester, we have a fruit collection. But if you take dendro in the spring, we'll do a twig collection for bonus. And the best time to do that is the very beginning of that spring semester. This is a big, white, fuzzy longleaf bud. We'll learn longleaf next week in lab. And longleaf pine, again, is a recurrently flushing species. So this is set and it may flush again after resting for a brief period of time within the same growing season. So that's what we would call a resting bud there. We have scales on buds that protect them. If you have just two scales, like you see here on this yellow poplar, it's also what we're going to see on almost all of our viburnums. It's called bow base. There's one scale there, one scale there, and then the bud within, you can see it also has two. They're kind of clasped together like your hands stuck together. Most of our species have imbricate scales. Imbricate means overlapping like shingles on your roof. So a shingle-like overlap is going to be imbricate scales. And then a few of our species don't have bud scales at all. So this is an example of a bitter nut hickory where it has these uh, naked buds and so what you're actually seeing are the leaf primordia themselves often on there. This week, we're going to learn poison ivy. You've probably never thought about poison ivy having twigs, but it does. Um, and it's going to have naked uh, buds, so no scales on there. Okay, so let's look through each of these other features we've got on the twigs, now that we've learned a little bit more about buds. And so you can whittle into the middle of a twig. This is a good reason to bring a sharp knife on a dendro lab, because you can use these as what I call a confirmation feature. You're not going to whittle every twig all semester, but if you look at something and say, I think that looks like a black walnut, and you can whittle into it and check out the pith and find out that it has this hollow chambered pith, pith being the middle of the twig, that's nice and chocolate brown in color. There you go. That's a good confirmation feature that, yeah, you did identify it correctly. It is a black walnut. Uh, this is a species that's a little harder to identify, Virginia sweet spire. So if you know it has chambered pith, that can be really helpful to confirm that you do in fact have a Virginia sweet spire. On some species, they'll have diaphragm pith where it's kind of got a white corky material in there and there'll be, you know, woody material between. It's kind of hard to tell in that photo. Usually that's harder to tell in, you know, just with your naked eye anyway. So those are going to be a little bit harder to spot. A lot of our species this semester have lenticels. So lenticels might be a dot, like on this Chinese tallow. Sometimes they might be like a, a line on there, like we see on our cherries often. And so this is just a corky protrusion. It's thought to help with gas exchange through the twig. But that's kind of a theory. No one really knows for sure. But they are helpful for ID on some species. Other species, they may not be as helpful. Okay, we're going to get leaf scars. And so You've got buds right here, and below every bud we're going to see all semester, there's going to be a leaf scar where the leaf was holding onto the twig and it has fallen off. And so this is another example of our sumacs, where you can tell the difference between smooth sumac, where this leaf scar goes almost all the way around the bud, and our wing sumac, where the leaf scar is mostly below it. It doesn't completely encircle it there. So species like the sumacs, species like the ashes, we're going to use a very similar trick to this to tell white ash and green ash apart, because otherwise they look like pretty much the same exact tree. Sometimes you don't just look at the leaf scar itself, but you actually look within it. 
So when you blow this photo up and look within this black gum leaf scar, what you'll notice is one, two, three dots on this oval or kidney bean shaped leaf scar. Those are gonna be our vascular bundle trace scars. And basically this is where the xylem and phloem connected between the leaf and the twig. So it's, you can think of it kind of as the plumbing connection there between the twig and the leaf itself. You see this line, kind of a series of lines right here around this twig. Um, that's going to be the bud scale scar. So you would have had a terminal bud there last year. All the scales fell off when that terminal bud broke and started growing in length, and they left this scar. It's almost never useful to help actually identify what tree that is, but it can be very helpful to tell you what a twig is. Everything here and up is going to be this year's growth, so that's a twig. Everything here and back is going to be last year's growth, so that was last year's twig is part of the branch now. And so you can see how fast branches and twigs are growing, um, and you can spot the difference between a twig and a branch using those scale scars. Here's another example of nodes and ear nodes. Everywhere you got buds, it's a node. Everywhere you don't have buds, it's between the nodes, so it's an inner node. This is important to know uh, on many species when we start thinking about how you're going to identify trees. So hopefully you all have viewed that lab video, intro to lab video online where it talks a lot about, are your trees opposite or alternate? Are they compound or simple? Well, if you're looking to see if your trees are opposite or alternate, sometimes you'll get a species and it'll look like it's opposite when in fact it's alternate, but that'll actually happen just because on that twig, maybe that twig's in deep shade, maybe it wasn't a great year in terms of growing conditions, and your internode growth may be very, very small under some circumstances, which will make an alternate species appear to be opposite. So when the internode doesn't grow very much, it can be hard to tell what the leaf arrangement on the tree is. So it's always helpful to look for the branching pattern. That may be more telling even than the leaves when you're looking for what the leaf arrangement is. We have a number of different modifications on our, some of our species that'll make them kind of prickly, right? So we have thorns on many species like hawthorn here. Uh, honey locust, black, or sorry, honey locust and water locust also have thorns. Thorn starts with T, twig starts with T. Thorns are modified twigs. So when you look at a tree, can you see a twig branching out of the main trunk of a tree? Yeah, you can see twigs coming right out of the main trunk of a tree. Can you find thorns coming right out of the main trunk of a tree? Yeah, because they're just modified twigs, exactly. So you can see these anywhere. Can a twig branch off another twig? Yeah, it can. And so thorns can actually branch as well, as we'll see on honey locusts in a few weeks. So thorns can be as long as twigs. They can be several inches long. The thorns on honey locusts can pop a truck tire. And so they're usually pretty large, pretty aggressive features. Spines, by contrast, are modified stipules. And a stipule is a tiny leafy projection at the base of a leaf. So a leaf would have come out right here, and on this black locust, we see two paired stipular spines. Because stipules often come in pairs, spines often come in pairs, whereas thorns aren't in pairs, they're singular or maybe branching. And so that's how you tell the difference between thorns and spines. We also have prickles, and here you see a couple examples with devil's walking stick. Um, and our Hercules club, and a prickle is modified cortex tissue. So think of it as a modification of the bark, basically. And so with that modified bark or cortex tissue, prickles can be just all over the place, all, all along the twig. They can even be on compound leaves, on different parts of the petiole, different parts of the rachis. Um, and then they can go down onto the bark. When this Hercules club gets bigger, these things turn into like big pyramid-like structures with a little prickle maybe coming out of it. Yeah, Chris. So if it's on the bark, if I were to like carve it away, would it not have like anything on the wood itself so it was there? Or? So you'll, you'll usually see like a discoloration where you've cut it away. Uh, so keep in mind that the bark is dead cortex tissue. And then after that, you get into the inner bark, which is gonna be the phloem, the cambium. And then within that is the xylem, which is the actual wood. Um, so if you cut a twig away, or a thorn away, it would be just like cutting a twig. Um, so you would see kind of a little scar where you cut it off. The, the spines, you know, they're right there by the base of the leaf. And then these, if you cut these off, you know, you'll see a discoloration, but yeah. 
And we see that a lot with Hercules Club. It's also called tickle tongue, uh, toothache tree, so people chew the bark. And it'll have a numbing, buzzing effect on your mouth. So people carve into that bark all the time. So that sort of brings us right to bark, right? Uh, so here's that Hercules Club bark right there. But we already looked at this photo back uh, a week ago, and so we've talked about all these different kinds of bark. But let's sort of look at how we might characterize bark a little bit better. Um, this was a system put together by some folks at a university up in the northeastern U.S. Uh, there's very few systems that give us terminology for bark. Usually we just sort of make up bark terminology as we go along, uh, unlike what we do with leaves and twigs and our other features. Uh, but this system, it applied to 75 species in the northeastern U.S., but it seems to work pretty well for our spe species here in the south as well. And so you can see the seven, or sorry, eight different categories here, and some of them are going to break up into subcategories. But if we look uh, for smooth on broken bark, American beech is our best example. No matter how big they get, they tend to have smooth, unbroken bark, so that makes them very easy to identify. We've already talked about lenticels. There's another example on Chinese tallow where bark on many species like this, black cherry, will have those corky white or orange or dark colored dots on them, raised dots. We have very few species where the bark actually peels horizontally. Where our bark tends to peel, it often peels vertically. So when it peels horizontally, that's unique around here and that makes identification easy. You can see this river birch is peeling horizontally. And so river birch is usually very easy to identify once it gets large enough that it bark, its bark peels like that. Uh, but very few other things this semester are going to have horizontally peeling bark. We'll have some species with vertical cracks or seams like you see here on this willow oak. Um, so that can be helpful. When we talk about scales, that, that's a little uh, sort of raised piece that you might be able to peel right off the tree. But when we talk about scales, you're thinking about something the size of a quarter, something the size of a corn flake. It's going to be relatively small in size, about the size of the, the pad on your thumb. Okay, And so this is a scale on black cherry, about the size of a quarter. And in this case, the scale actually has lenticels on it, too. So sometimes you can combine some of these different categories. If you learn black cherry bark, you'll always get black cherry. That's one of the best features on it. On some of these species, bark is going to be critical. A plate is the same as a scale, it's just bigger. Now think about it being the size of the palm of your hand. Okay, so a plate is just a larger scale, and that's all it is. We can see the platey bark here on our sycamore. Um, this week in lab, we're going to learn uh, white oak, and white oak has really platey bark, especially on some of them that makes ID pretty easy. We'll have bark that peels in vertical strips. So if you're familiar with any of the junipers from Central Texas, West Texas, they all do this. Our Eastern Red Cedar, which is also a juniper, it does this, hop hornbeam. Several other species have vertically peeling bark. And then finally, we have bark with ridges and furrows, and you can divide that into three subcategories. Uh, here's a big fancy word for you, anastomosing. Um, all that means is that the ridges break apart and form back together, break apart and form back together. So it'll form diamond shapes like you see right here on this chitopor. So for anastomosing bark, we're going to get a bunch of those already in week one. The hickories do that, the ashes do that, yellow poplar does that, titum wood, a number of other species. But once you see that, it's kind of like a, a grid pattern, a diamond grid pattern uh, that usually stands out as pretty obvious. We have some species where you can see the vertical ridges, but they're also split apart horizontally. Uh, that's a common persimmon. We'll get that week two. And you can see how distinct that bark is. Looks like a gator back, something like that. And then on this sassafras, we have ridges that are unbroken. They're not horizontally broken. They're not anastomosing. So that's our final category. So this was all the different categorization of the northeastern United States. But when you start looking at our southern trees, we can add in more options. So we have warty bark, like you see here on sugarberry. There's nothing wrong with this sugarberry. That's just what they look like. We'll learn this uh, here in lab this week. Anyone heard of hackberry? Someone tells you they've got a hackberry in Texas. It's actually a sugarberry. Uh, they're pretty much the same tree, but they are actually different species. We've got prickles like we've seen now a few times on our Hercules Club. And we've got thorns like we talked about on our water locusts and honey locusts. 
So there's a few other categories we can add in. Okay, so that all sort of brings us to leaves. We're about halfway through class now. I want to spend the rest of the class talking about leaves, since that's what you're going to focus on for the most part this semester. And so here we have a simple leaf where it just has one blade on it. The blade is not subdivided into multiple blades as would be on a compound leaf. And here we have the blade of the leaf, which is what most of us think of as just the leaf, right? That's the leafy part. It's connected to the twig by the petiole. The bud and the twig are not part of the leaf. Those are part of the twig. So the leaf actually starts here and goes this way. You have the midrib, which is the vein holding up much of the leaf. You have the edge of the leaf, which is called the margin. You have the apex, which is the tip of the leaf. And then you have the base of the leaf down here. Um, you can see these two little dots on this. This leaf has glands on it, on the petiole. So that'll tell you you have some sort of cherry or plum. And so uh, species in the Prunus and Pyrus genus and the Rosaceae family will tend to have those features. So that can actually help you with ID if you notice something like that. We also have compound leaves. And so this is sort of uh, one of the more simple types of compound leaves uh, where instead of it being one leaf blade, it's split up into a bunch of little leaflets. Okay, and then there's other types of compound leaves here where each of these leaflets is split up into more, making it bifinately compound. And then if each of these little leaflets is split up into more, it gets really complicated and becomes trifinately compound. You can see that as well. If you have only three leaflets, like we'll see on poison ivy this week, that's going to be trifoliate. If all the leaflets join in a middle point, it's like fingers coming out of the palm of your hand, that's going to be palmately compound. When we talk about a compound leaf, the terminology changes a little. The petiole connects the leaf to the twig. But once you hit the first leaflets, this is no longer the petiole. Now it's the rachis or the rachis, however you want to pronounce it. Instead of having a blade on a single leaf, you now have multiple leaflets, and they may be connected to the rachis with the petiole unit. Sometimes this is also called secondary rachis. You'll see it written out both ways. So, so that petiole rachis terminology changes a little bit with the compound. We already saw in that intro to lab video, most of our species this semester are alternate, where the leaves alternate from each other on the twig. A much smaller proportion of them are opposite. That's where our Mad Cat Big Hippo acronym comes in. So you can see that there. We'll learn two species in lab this semester that are world, where they have uh, more than two leaves at each node. And so that's going to be button bush and catalpa in terms of our world species, and that's it. So if you spot something that's world, it's easy. We do have a few species like our azaleas, where the internode growth is often slow, and so they appear to be world often when they are not. So that slow internode growth can be confusing. Okay, so then we've got a bunch of different shapes to our leaves. We've got a bunch of different terminology for lobing, a bunch of different terminology for leaf margins, a bunch of different terminology for leaf apices, a lot of different terminology for leaf bases, a bunch of different terminology for venation patterns, and then gymnosperm leaves, conifer leaves, often have their own terminology. It's completely separate. So rather going through that in detail and boring you to tears, what we're going to do instead is a little activity, uh, give you an opportunity for some bonus points. So what I have here are a bunch of herbaria sheets. So you can work together in pairs or in groups, just make sure y'all are still staying six feet apart. Uh, you can take one of these herbaria sheets and you can jot down the uh, name. The name will be written on there. And then what you can do is you can start looking through it start trying to identify, and I've got a sheet here where you can fill it out, and the sheet also has all these diagrams I just went through, so those will be available for you. You can look at it and start saying, does it have simple leaves? Does it have compound leaves? Is it alternate? Is it opposite? What's the leaf shape? What's the leaf margin? And start applying all these terms. Um, a few things that are going to help you with that, on these are various sheets, look for buds to tell if it's compound or simple. There will be a bud at the base of each leaf. But the buds on some of these species are small, some of these are older, so they're a little beat up, they may be hard to see. If it's compound, don't try to describe the shape of a whole compound leaf, just describe the shape of the compound leaflet. That's going to help you. When you're looking at leaf shapes, ignore lobing. 
So if you have a leaf that's roughly round, but it's got some lobes cut into it, ignore the lobes, kind of trace around the lobes, and that might be orbicular, for example, which is our term for a round leaf shape. On these species, this branch might be variable. There might be two or even three leaf shape or leaf margin terms that are correct on here. So if you look at this leaf and you're like, oh, that's definitely this term and then this leaf, but that's a different term, they may both be right. You just have variability. Okay, so don't be concerned if there's multiple right answers on some of these. Any questions?